And I do have the privilege and honor of getting to preach this Sunday when we pivot this series to focus specifically on the message and what Jesus shared with these men as he taught them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And it's interesting to me that we opened up today talking about this idea of seeing, and there are a lot of different ways to look at different situations, different illustrations in our world. And so in my mind this week, as I was preparing, I went back to some psychology 101 days. So I want to show you a couple of pictures. I want to put them up on the big screen. And I want to ask you, what do you see? So here's picture number one. Let's take a little vote. How many of you see a goblet or a cup? Anybody see that? Okay. How many of you see two faces looking at each other? Okay. More of you. Interesting. How many of you just saw nothing at all? Okay. All right. Glad you're awake. Okay, here, on to the next one. Here we go. Take a look at this one for a moment. Tell me what you see. Do you see a young woman who's got her face turned away like this? How many of you see that? Okay, how many of you see an older woman with her face kind of buried in her collar with a rather large nose? Anybody see that? Okay, all right, good. All right, you're doing well. You're tracking with me here. Thanks for staying awake. All right, here's the next one. It's going to get a little trickier. What do you see now? Somebody said, Waldo, did I just hear that? (laughs) Maybe in there somewhere. I was never any good at those either. Do anybody remember these? So called 3D stereograms or magic eye pictures. Okay, what you should be seeing if you were up close enough would be the Statue of Liberty. Anybody see that? Okay, because if you did, you're amazing. Because even when these were in the mall, even when people were publishing books of these things about 10 years ago, I would walk up to these things and I would stare at them for days and nothing would happen. There's a famous episode of Seinfeld where Elaine's boss, they can't get any work done because he keeps going by the mall, you know, trying to see, you know, the picture come off the page. And I tried it again and again and I could never get it. I thought it was even a prank when they first put these things in the mall, you know, a candid camera thing to get you to stand there and just look like a fool because that's exactly what I felt like because I just didn't get it. And then finally I had a friend who said, no, 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 Jay, here's the trick. You've got to look through the picture. Fantastic. I'm Superman now. Okay. To look through things. I don't know. So I tried it and sure enough, just maybe one time a little bit, I I could see it. And it was pretty cool. What happens is this, as your eyes almost go cross and you really are feeling silly, all of a sudden the picture jumps off the page. And I think that's similar to what happens spiritually for these two men that were walking with Jesus on the Emmaus road. They thought they had the story. They thought they saw the picture of what was supposed to happen. That Jesus was going to be this great military and political ruler who was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and they were going to be on the winning team. And instead, Jesus suffers. He's crucified. They leave Jerusalem sad because this wasn't the way they thought the picture should look. And now Jesus walks alongside of them. After he listens to them, then he turns to them and teaches them, as Luke says, all things in the scriptures concerning himself, going all the way back to Moses, all the way back to the Pentateuch, all the way back to Genesis, walks them through the stories, the covenants, the promises, into the prophets, and he teaches them so that the story comes up off the page, so that it comes alive to them in a way that they've never seen it before. This morning, we're going to go back to the covenant promise with Abraham to begin to see how God designed a people to be his very own, that they were blessed through their forefather Abraham in order that they might be a blessing to the world, a blessing that would come to its full fulfillment in the ministry and the life of Jesus who opened the doors of the kingdom to all. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read Genesis chapter 12 this morning? Genesis 12, beginning in verse one. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram 
went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So God said, go. And Abram went. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you that when Jesus came, that he showed us your truth. God, that from the very first words of Genesis to the end of Revelation, God, that the story that we now have is your story. It's your great story. And God, stories like Abraham show us how you've come to us, how you've chosen us, how you've initiated with us and met us. So Father, we can be faithful in responding to you. God, I pray today that we would understand our story, the story of our lives, the story of this church and this nation and this world in the light of your greater story. God, that we will be a people who recognize the grace that we've received so that we can extend it to all nations. Blessed to be a blessing. Father, open our ears and our hearts. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. So I know some of you right now are in your mind trying to ponder the connection. So God said, go. Abraham went. What does that have to do with Jesus? Well, big point number one for today. Jesus is the interpretive key for all of scripture and all of history. Jesus is the lens that we need to see all of Scripture through and all of history. One of the amazing things about this moment as Jesus is walking with these men is that he gives them this incredible gift. He takes them back and he shows them himself, how all of the Old Testament Scriptures were pointing to him. And when I used to read this passage, I used to get so frustrated because I would be like, Luke, where's that book? That's the one that I want to read. Why didn't you write that one down for us? Man, I would love to have that. Yeah, it might have taken you a little longer, you know, but really? And then the more I studied the New Testament, the more I began to realize that we did have that story. We did have those truths captured for us. Do you remember last week we talked about the fact that when these two men burst back into the room with the disciples, they began to tell and retell the story of how Jesus had appeared to them? Well, as you journey through the New Testament, the book of Acts, the letters of Paul, all the way to Revelation, you begin to see all of these quotes from the Old Testament. In the book of Acts itself, you begin to see Peter on the very day of Pentecost stand up and he preaches. And what does he go back to? He goes back to the Old Testament to show how, why Jesus had to come, why it was necessary in the words of Jesus himself for him to suffer and die. You see Stephen doing the same thing. You see Paul doing that on Mars Hill in Acts 15. And then you see all of these quotes scattered throughout the New Testament where it's Jesus popping up off the page as they were reading the Old Testament scriptures. They saw it in a way that they had never seen it before. And so now they were beginning to connect the dots. And it was an incredible experience for them, just like it is for us to realize that Jesus is the lens by which we see everything, the lens by which we interpret and understand our world. I have four young children. And one of the things that we make a priority in our home at least a few nights a week is to have a time to sit down at a meal together and we do our devotions after the meal is done and before dessert. Learned that's the trick to keep my kids focused. And so I've used different resources over the years. There's lots of them out there. But my favorite one for Tanya and I has become this. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And its subtitle, I love, Every Story Whispers His Name. It goes back and goes through all of the Old Testament stories and points forward to the ministry of Jesus. Helps children and helps me understand what God was doing in the big picture and how we can see Jesus as the interpretive key for the entire Old Testament. Because you see, there is a big story. As Mike mentioned in the video, we call this the meta-narrative. Meta is the word that means beyond. Narrative is the word that means story. So literally, meta-narrative is the story beyond the story. Or in this case, the story above all other stories. 
We've been talking some in the last six weeks about the challenges of sharing our faith with people in our era. That our world is dominated today by something that we call the postmodern worldview. That worldview is skeptical. It's, it doesn't believe everything that it's told. People who live with that understanding are naturally and inherently skeptical because they feel like the stories they have been told have turned out not to be true. At some point in their life, they were given or fed a philosophy by our culture. It said, if you achieve more, then you'll find fulfillment. A story that said, if you just find the right relationship, if you just find the right career, if you can just make yourself happy, then you'll feel fulfilled. And somewhere along the way, when that story doesn't play out the way they wanted it to, that story breaks down. And so they lose their trust in any story that dictates their life, and they're just left trying to figure out things on their own. And so life just seems like it's random. Everything seems like it's meaningless to them. I'll argue that the reason is not because the story has been broken down. The reason is because they haven't been taught the greatest story of all. The reason for us as believers is sometimes we dive in and we believe the story that our culture sells us more than we trust in the gospel story itself. You see, it's the big story. It's God's story of what he's been doing throughout all time and throughout all history. And that was the gift that Jesus gave these men. And that's the gift that we're given in the word of God. And as we study it, we begin to understand how God works in themes and patterns. He's not formulaic. It's a relationship that he's after. But yet we can see consistently how God has worked despite circumstances, despite overwhelming odds, that our God is a God that can be trusted. That's the great story. Begins all the way back in Genesis with creation. This idea, this word blessing comes out of Genesis 1. It says God created man and woman and blessed them. Now, in our culture, when we hear the word blessing, we automatically default to material goods and possessions. But biblically, that is just a tiny, tiny little fraction of God's blessing for us. God's blessing is relational, that God created man and woman to be in relationship with him. And they created him to extend that relationship over the dominion, over all the earth, subdue the earth, be fruitful, multiply. God gave Adam and Eve his grace. This was a gift from God so that they could extend his glory over all the earth. That's creation. God created and it was very good. But we know what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve decided and instead of just being in a relationship with God that they wanted to be God. And so... They fell prey to the great tempter. And when they fell, the entire world fell with it. The disease of sin entered the human story. Everything became twisted. Everything became broken. Creation it itself rebelled against its creator. And so now we have the mess of a world that we're left in. But if you study it closely, and we'll talk about this more next week, a little teaser you'll understand that from the very moment that Adam and Eve fell, the prophecy is there that God began to initiate his plan to redeem mankind. Creation, fall, redemption. And that when Jesus came, when he paid the price that we could not pay, when he did for us on the cross what we could not do for ourselves, then he earned the redemption of mankind. When he was resurrected from the dead, now he had conquered sin and death so that we could have life and that we could have the fourth great theme of scripture, hope. I'm not talking about some flimsy hope like we talk about, like, hey, I hope I get to go out to eat today. Hey, I hope my team's gonna win the ball game this weekend. I'm talking about biblical hope, which means that we are certain of even those things that we cannot see. Why? Because God promised us. Because God uh, gave it to us so that we could believe in him and put our weight down in our belief, in the hope that we have not achieved yet, but for the hope that we know is certain, that one day Jesus is going to come back and he'll wipe every tear from our eye and everything that's broken will be fixed. 
And between now, redemption, receiving him in, in faith, Our belief, we now have the opportunity to join him in his mission to bring the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God to bear in this world. Creation, fall, redemption, hope. That's the meta narrative. That's the story that you and I are a part of. You see, it's bigger than we ever dreamed. And sometimes we need that perspective in our life because our emotions, our circumstances, those things will betray us. Sometimes we need a different outlook. We need a different set of lenses to interpret and to understand what's going on in our lives because we're so close to it that we can't see the big picture of what God's doing. This past fall, my daughter Lexi turned eight years old. She's my middle daughter. And Lexi is our experiential child. Man, she wants to experience things. She wants to be a part of it. And so every time for the last couple of years when I've gotten on an airplane, she's like, Daddy, take me with you. I want to go with you. That's no fair. You get to go on a plane. She obviously hasn't had an airport experience, you know, to know how frustrating it is. She still thinks it's really, really cool. And so my wife has a friend whose dad's a pilot. And so as a surprise to Lexi, we loaded her up in the car on the day of her birthday. We drove out and just said, we're going somewhere for your birthday. Where is it? Where is it, mom? Where is it, dad? And we just started driving and driving. And Lexi's been talking this big game this whole time about wanting to get on an airplane. Well, as we begin to get close to the airport, she begins to look around and realize she sees the lights, she sees the runway, she sees the control tower. And then all of a sudden she starts to get nervous. <laughs> uh, Daddy, where are we going? <laughs> You'll see Lexi, just hang on. Uh, no, Daddy, really, where, where are we going? I said, what does it look like, Lexi? She goes, this looks like an airport. It's like, bingo, you're right. And we pull up to the hangar and we get out and now she's really starting to get nervous. And she's like, daddy, I don't don't know if I can get in that plane. She goes, I think I'm gonna throw up. (laughs) She's not even on the airplane yet. So we coax and we prod, Lexi, this is your birthday. We set this up, it's a big deal. We get her in that little prop plane. She and her sister take off, they zoom into the sky. I'm thinking, oh, I forgot to send the barf bag. This might not turn out well. It may be one riding over today. But they land the plane. Lexi gets out, and I've got the camera ready, you know, and I don't know if it's going to be, or, you know. Instead, she gets out, grin, a mile wide. (laughs) Big thumbs up. I got a picture of her doing that right there. She loved it. She loved it. I got to go up a little bit later with our two and a half year old boy, daddy fly, daddy fly. He didn't want to be left behind. So we got to ride. While I'm up there, the pilot says to me over the radio, you know, Jay, this is one of my favorite places to just spend some time in prayer. Look down there. You can see Shelbyville. You can see Antioch. You can see where you live down in Spring Hill. You, you, the perspective is just totally different. It's peaceful. It's quiet up here. And what I love most is that when I get discouraged in my life, When I get up here, I can see the horizon again. Man, what a beautiful picture for us. What a beautiful gift Jesus gave his disciples. What a gift God gives us in his word. And he lifts us above our day-to-day challenges. He lifts us above the muck and the mire, as David called it in the Psalms. That he gives us a chance to see the horizon again, to have that hope again. Like Lexi, my daughter, I think a lot of times we're nervous When we think about it, God, I'm just living right here. I'm just doing what I can do. You know, don't show me anything else. I don't know that I can handle it. And yet when God does, when we hear truth spoken from his word, when God speaks to us in a powerful way, then we come out going like this. It's good. I can see again. I can see what God's doing. And so that brings us all the way back to the story of Abraham. Look at these words carefully with me that we read just a little bit ago. Because we begin to see the big picture of what God is doing. Now interpreted through what Jesus did, we look back and we see that God calls Abraham and he says to him, go. Could be, it's the imperative, the same word you could translate it, leave the country and your family that you're a part of. And go where? To the land that I will show you. Um, God, I would like a little bit more of a plan here. God, could you give me an agenda? Could you at least tell me where we're going before I pack up my wife, my household, my servant, all of these things? Could you give me a plan? It's not what the text says. God simply called to Abram, said, go. The remarkable thing about his response is that in this era of time, 
We're talking a primitive people, an ancient age. Everything was tied to your birth family. Your inheritance, your security, your job, your identity, who you were, everything was bound up in your family. And yet in some of the most remarkable displays of faith in Scripture, it says, Abraham went. He went. He trusted this God. No, he didn't get it. He didn't have the big picture yet. He didn't understand everything. But God continually repeated to him, even in this one covenant, in just these few verses, I will, I will, I will. In other words, Abraham, you have a part in this, this play. You have a part in this story. But my part is to do the heavy list, lifting. My part is that I am God of the great story. And I will do these things. Why? I will bless you. Why? So that you can be a blessing to all nations. I'm going to make you a great nation, God tells him. At that point, Abraham had some questions because he had no children. You see, God has this incredible way of making his glory known in unusual situations. He takes ordinary people, calls them, comes to us, blesses us in extraordinary ways. Why? First, so we can enjoy the benefit of a relationship with him. Again, there is something that God purposes in his story. There is something that God lays out from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, and that's God's desire to be in relationship with his people. He created us for relationship, Genesis 1. The end of the story in Revelation is what? The great banquet hall, the new heaven and the new earth. And God says, now forever, they will be my people. I will be their God and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. You see, that's God's great purpose, that he created us for him, for a relationship with him. And so God comes to Abraham, this guy who was imperfect, this guy who had no children, and yet he tells him, I'm going to bless you and make you a great nation. What you need to hear, church, is that this story includes you. You are important and you matter to God because you were created in his image. But this story that you're a part of is much larger than you. This story is about God and his eternal purposes and plan. And God blesses you, not just so you can be blessed, but so that you can be a blessing to others, so that you can extend his name, so that you can extend his glory, so that you can tell the story of what he's done in your life. It's a friend of mine who comes to our Station Hill campus. He was a missionary in Mexico City for 25 years with the International Mission Board. Shared a testimony with our people a few weeks ago. Said he kept going back to the story of scripture. And matter of fact, that God led him specifically to the gospels right after he arrived in Mexico City. And for almost 25 years, he searched the gospels for the key that was gonna unlock the secret that was gonna win that city of 26 million people to Christ. And he says with just this gravitas, with just this honest emotion, I never found that secret. I never found that key. But Craig Johnson says this, this is what I discovered, that Jesus wanted all of me, that Jesus wanted all of my heart, that he wanted all of my life, that I did indeed have dignity and purpose and identity in his plan because of the God who created me, loved me and sent Jesus so that I could have a relationship with him. And yes, I am still faithful to share him with other people. But what I discovered that blew me away was God's heart for me. And that God wanted to then use me out of that relationship to impact other people, to share with them the good news. This was the reality that Paul knew. And it's so fascinating for me to watch that pivot in the New Testament stories, the New Testament letters, to see how they would go back and they would grab these old stories and say, now that Jesus has come, this makes sense to us. Look with me in Galatians chapter 3. I love this passage. Paul is talking with the Galatians about the gospel, about are they believing in God's grace and are they receiving that through their faith response? Is that what they are relying on for their salvation? Or is it still about works? 
Is it still about the things that they do to get to God under their own steam? And he calls them out much like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. He says, you foolish Galatians, what gospel has bewitched you? In other words, what smaller story are you living in instead of the great story of God's truth for you? And it says this in verse 7 of chapter 3, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. It's making the connection. Abraham responded in faith. God blessed him and his family. Now those who respond in faith, they are the true sons, spiritual descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, those outside of the Jewish religion, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And isn't it interesting that over and over again in the New Testament stories about Abraham, the thing that he's credited it for is not all of his achievements, not all of his accomplishments, not his resume, but simply that he had faith. That's what God brings to us. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your story has been so far. God's story is greater. He brings you Jesus. Creation, fall, we live with the results, the messiness of the fall. But in Jesus Christ, all those things are redeemed so that we can have hope and share that hope with other people. Paul put it this way in Romans 9, looking back, interpreting the minor prophet Hosea, all call the nobodies and make them somebodies. All call the unloved and make them beloved. It's God's message for us. But so often we're living out the smaller story instead of realizing that God's great story for us is so much larger that he's given us a role to play. You know, this time of year, I'm a a big basketball fan. I grew up in basketball country. Southern Illinois is where I grew up. It's kind of like Indiana. Basketball's the big deal there. And I don't know if you've had your television on for the last couple of days, but it's hard to get away from basketball. So that's where my mind's been. And I went back as I was meditating on this passage to a story of something that happened to me in high school. It was my senior year. And at Southern Illinois, being a starter your senior year on the high school varsity team is about the biggest achievement, the biggest accomplishment, the biggest honor that you can have. And so I remember as we went all through preseason, this is what I had worked my entire life for, you know, going to basketball camps, endless hours of practice, you know, two a days, shooting hundreds and hundreds of baskets. And so it came time for that big game, the first game of our senior year, and I was so excited. We were playing a team from farther down south in Illinois, from uh, Cairo, Illinois, and, uh, and they were nationally ranked at the time. And so nobody gave us a chance. Nobody gave us a chance, but it was, there was excitement in the air, and it was the day of the big game, and so we got in the locker room after warm-ups, and the coach tapped me on the shoulder and said, Jay, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm going to let another guy start in your place, but you'll be the sixth man. Don't worry. You'll get in the game. So I was a little disappointed, but I was like, it's all good. I'll get in. So the game opens up, and I think these guys are tired after the two-hour bus ride north, and so they're kind of lollygagging with our guys. They're hanging in the game. The first quarter ends, and hey, we're hanging with these guys. Second quarter begins and, you know, one of our guys starts to get in foul trouble and I think, great, I'm going to get in the game and I'm, you know, slicking up my shoes and I'm getting my warm up, you know, pulled off and I'm ready to go. And the coach reaches down for a guy on the other side of me and puts him in the game. Halftime comes. I've still got my head in the huddle because I know that, man, this opportunity is going to come and I want to, want to be there. I want to be ready to play my role and my part. Third quarter comes. We're back and forth. Seesaw battle with these guys. There's now some real electricity in the gymnasium because, man, we were a bunch of short guys who were, you know, holding, staying with this nationally ranked team. And so we get to the fourth quarter and, man, it's nip and tuck now when the coach keeps sending guys in and I just keep sliding farther and farther down the bench. We get into the last minute of play. We slow down the offense. They come out. Our guy throws it to the corner. Dude shoots a three-pointer. We win. The place goes nuts. I mean, this is probably the most exciting thing to happen in my little hometown ever. And fans rush onto the court. Players are jumping up on top of each other. Man, flash bulbs are going off everywhere. And I'm sitting at the end of the bench going, why? I didn't get in the game. I was sitting on the sidelines. And here's the reality for so many of us, church. 
is that God is winning a great victory. There are incredible things that he is doing in his kingdom. He, God is doing amazing things in our generation. He is blessing some people who understand it, that it's their role to be a blessing to all nations. But there's so many of us, even when God calls to us, we're sitting on the sidelines. We're missing out. We're not playing our role. I had to come to grips with the fact that my team won. The story of the day was that my team upset a nationally ranked powerhouse. The story of Jay that day was that I didn't get in the game. We have to realize that God comes to us, that he calls to us, that he says, I'll take the nobodies and make them somebodies. I'll call the unloved and make them beloved. Abraham, I came to you, started with you. Why? Because you were the last guy that somebody would pick, a guy with no kids to make a great nation by which God would get all of the glory. The reality for many of you here today, you feel like there's something in your life that's kept you sidelined, but I want you to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed to you. By grace, you are saved through faith. And in your belief, God can do more in your story as he weaves it into his large story than you ever dreamed possible. You see, the reality of scripture is this. We are not saved. Our lives are not made worth living by the promises that we make to God. Our response, just like Abraham's, is the fact that we have to believe in the promises that God has made to us. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? No, we've covered a lot of ground today. Going from the Emmaus Road back to the big picture of all of Scripture, back into the story of Abram. And now comes the time for us to grapple with this. Two questions for you today. One, do you know God's story? Is Jesus the lens? the key by which you see everything, the lens by which you understand what's happening in your world and in your life. Question number two, what's your part in God's story? Has God called to you and you've rejected him saying, God, I can do this on my own. Really, I've got this. And you're living by works. You're trying to get to God in your own strength. Or are you believing in the story, the great story of the gospel, that you can't get to God, that God has come to you? Do you know God's story? And do you know your story? If you don't, if you have questions, in just a moment, my friends and I are going to be in this room we call the parlor. We want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. Because it begins there. One of the most captivating things to me about Abraham's story is is that God chose this man. It's almost unbelievable that God in his greatness and his glory comes down and chooses a man and decides I'm going to capture his heart for the sake of my great name. Just like God may be here today, that God is here today and may be calling to you saying, I want to capture your heart. This is where it all begins. We want to pray with you and talk with you. Heavenly Father, our eyes and our ears are open. Help us to be faithful to respond to you. Told Abraham to go, and he went. Maybe you're calling some of us to go today. Father, you're calling to us, believe. John says this is how we respond to grace. It's by belief. And today the Spirit's drawing you to respond. Whatever you're grappling with, whatever the Spirit's doing in your heart, do not leave this place until you've connected with the God who comes to you, who offers you forgiveness, hope, redemption, peace, life. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for opening the eyes to these two men and opening our eyes. 